there was really nothing that could be done for her, according to them. Tonight, the first hearings of the new year begin in Yellowknife for the national inquiry into missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. There are now already 58 new schools that are uh, being built and dozens more renovations underway. Canada's Indigenous Services Minister outlines her five key priorities. I consider it almost an insane thing to think that you should, could put all that oil into a, a populated city. And Burnaby residents learn how the Trans Mountain Pipeline will run almost right through their backyards. Good evening, I'm Brittany Hobson. The National Inquiry into Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls is in the Northwest Territories today. And because people who want to testify can register on the same day, the number of families and survivors who will take part is growing. Our Yellowknife reporter Charlotte Mork Jacobs is covering the inquiry and has this update. It's the first day of community hearings in Yellowknife for the National Inquiry into Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls. It's been eight months since the inquiry launched in the North. Three commissioners today will hear from around 40 families who will testify both publicly and privately. For us to work together to have this gathering so that they can be heard. The Native Women's Association of the NWT has been on the ground preparing families for the inquiry. Beside me, I have the president of the Native Women's Association of the NWT, Liza Charlo Piper. Thank you so much for the interview. Um, first question for you, Liza. Uh, what does it mean to have the inquiry come to the NWT? Uh, it's very meaningful for the uh, the people of the Northwest Territories and also for the Native women and for the victims that were um, that have lost their lives and for their families and they need their voice to be heard so and to help them deal with their the issues. Um, we heard so far just one case from uh, Angela Meyer's family and they spoke a lot about um, uh, inadequate social services for uh, for young people, for everyone in the North. Um, do you have any personal recommendations for that you're going to be sharing or that you, you hope commissioners will walk away with when it comes to issues in the North? I think uh, one of the problems that I'm hearing is um, the justice system and how they were dealt with and also um, one of the family members had mentioned um, um, the, the support system, the support that is provided to the families and also the, um, uh, the justice system where the, uh, from the police uh, treatment where they had hoped that um, they had done uh, DNA testing. So far we've heard from Angela Meyer's family Angela was last seen by the Mackenzie River crossing nearly six years ago, disappearing without a trace. The family spoke towards inadequate supports for mental health needs, and RCMP, who at the time denied completing a DNA test on a coat that was found in the bush that was believed to be Angela's. Charlotte Moore Jacobs, APTN National News, Yellowknife. Here is part of the testimony from Angela Meyer's family. Dean and Kathy Meyer spoke of their daughter's mental illness and the lack of mental health resources in Yellowknife. Well, sometimes it was so heartbreaking to go visit her. Um, she went through so many doctors and psychiatrists, and every time she seen a new one, they would change her medications, and some days she would be way out there and then other days she would be so doped up that she wouldn't you could hardly talk to her and she wouldn't remember you visiting the next day oh, it was very stressful for her family we even had one psychiatrist tell us that she was faking it <laughs> <clears throat> When he told me that, and I said, well, good. Then you can go back to wherever you came from, and we won't have to talk anymore. <laughs> and I'm sorry, but that was the politest thing that I could think of saying at the moment. There are many in our community in Yellowknife that have this. There was really nothing that could be done for her, according to them. 
the healthcare professionals, well, limited resources. Um, it was only when she became 18 that she was able to access programs in the community because she was an adult. And because she became an, when she became an adult, it seems, again, there were limited things for her. We welcome your comments on this or any of our stories. Here's how to contact us. Send an email to news at aptn.ca, like our APTN National News Facebook page, follow us on Twitter at APTN News, or go over to our website, aptnnews.ca. The Department of Indigenous Services was created just five months ago. Today, its minister, Jane Philpott, gave a lengthy briefing about what has been accomplished and what needs to be done. As APTN's Tom Lyberan reports, the theme right now is to eventually hand control over to services over to Indigenous people. Indigenous Services Minister Jane Philpott and her Deputy Minister Jean-Francois Tremblay outlined five priority areas in health, education, children and families, infrastructure, and a new fiscal relationship, focusing on self-determination in each. This department should disappear over time. Services to Indigenous people should be delivered. That's the objective, should be delivered by Indigenous organizations. In health, Philpott emphasized Indigenous control in things as diverse as mental wellness, services for substance abuse, or maternal health support. She looked to the West Coast as a template moving forward. And one of the best examples of that is in British Columbia, where we have seen the tremendous success of the British Columbia First Nations Health Authority, which has entirely taken over the leadership, the management, and the delivery of health services for First Nations in British Columbia. In education, Philpott credited the $2.6 billion allotted in the last federal budget. There are now already 58 new schools that are uh, being built and dozens more renovations underway. Again, she pointed to self-determination as the way forward like the Mi'kmaq education agreement that has taken place in Nova Scotia, where we have seen graduation rates go up to as high as 89%. And this is as a result of the first self-government agreement in education in Canada for First Nations. However, dollar figures mentioned at the press conference are not from new funding. The only promise of more dollars to come in the upcoming budget was in the area of child and families as the government must comply with a human rights tribunal ruling to not discriminate between Indigenous and non-Indigenous children. I have described the Indigenous child welfare system in this country as a humanitarian crisis. Philpott will be having an emergency meeting on child welfare with provincial and Indigenous stakeholders. The, the meeting this week is not going to be about assigning blame. The meeting this week is going to be about saying nobody thinks that the, what's happening now is right who's prepared to look at alternative models, how are we going to fund those alternative models, how are we going to change policies uh, so that kids can be with their families. That meeting happens this Thursday and Friday and we'll have full coverage of that. Paul Lamaran, APTN National News, Ottawa. Todd, your story had three of the five priorities Minister Philpott talked about. What about infrastructure and a new fiscal relationship? Yes, Brittany. As far as infrastructure goes, Minister Philpott went at length about boil water advisories. The federal government had got it down to 67 last year, but then it added 247 systems they considered public. And when I say public, they're including things like systems in community centres, for example. Uh, so of that 247, 24 have been added, so the total is now 91 boil water advisories. But Philpott explains she still believes that she can get that figure down to zero by 2021. They had funding agreements that would only be one year or two years, and they were dealing with putting systems in place in some of the remote, most remote communities in our country. So they now have the confidence of five-year funding uh, that is available uh, as we work with communities, and that allows them to do the necessary work to do a feasibility study to design the specifics of what a system would look like in that unique geographic area, to bring in uh, the construction equipment that would be necessary. Sometimes you're dealing with communities that are only accessible certain times of year by winter roads, for example, and 
and equipment has to be delivered um, on barges or in various other uh, ways. So sometimes it takes two to three years. You're seeing a slow uh, curve over the first year or two because some of those um, that are about to be completed and we, can, we anticipate uh, at least 20 more long-term drinking water advisories will be lifted in the coming year. And again, you can look at uh, the charts that are available to you to see exactly what those target dates are. We, though, hope that we'll be able to advance, move up as many of those completion dates as possible, particularly on the 24 new communities that have been brought on where they haven't yet had the opportunity to do the work and identify exactly what the construction schedule would look like. As far as a new fiscal relationship is concerned, Philpott basically said the Harper government's First Nations Governance Act is dead. She also reiterated a promise she made at last month's AFN Annual General Assembly where she talked about long-term sustainable funding. We also are going to do work on intervention policies, which you may know are uh, to date uh, regressive policies, such as the third-party management approach that punishes communities rather than works with them to build capacity. We are working towards systems where that funding will be sustainable and predictable in a nation-to-nation, government-to-government, and Inuit-to-Crown relationship. We intend to pr provide much more flexibility and that will support long-term planning. You may know of announcements that were made in December where we talked about working with First Nations financial institutions as well as the Assembly of First Nations on possibilities like developing 10-year grants and we have a goal to potentially uh, reach the uh, possibility of 100 communities by 2019 that will have 10-year grants. Of course, some of these promises go beyond the Trudeau government's mandate, as they must face the voters by the fall of 2019. Brittany. Thank you, Todd. That was Todd Lamarand reporting from Ottawa. To, put, to Winnipeg now, where the local chapter of the Bear Clan Patrol is getting a financial boost from the city. Mayor Brian Bowman says the city will provide $13,000 to the patrol. The money will go toward helping the group purchase much-needed items such as radios, cell phones and a defibrillator. The group patrols five nights a week in Winnipeg's North End. The money will also go toward helping the group expand their foot patrol into different areas of the city. Every little bit helps. It, it's not insignificant, so it's definitely going to help our efforts getting the things we need to, uh, to be productive in that community. We're going to be working out of the University of Winnipeg at the Hive there, and uh, yeah, it, it'll, it'll grow naturally. At first, we're just going to be a small footprint, but we hope to grow that. The National Energy Board is in BC this week for hearings on the Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion project, where they are getting a strong pushback from the cities of Burnaby and Vancouver. That story coming up after the break. But first, here's a clip from tonight's edition of Face to Face, where satirical newsman Tim Fontaine is our guest, right after APTN National News. We're funny people, and yet we don't, we don't see that reflected necessarily in the media. So I want to take it from what it is now, which is like a, a, a panel of comedians, and turn it into more something like The Daily Show, and, and take a funny look at, at news and, and how we're covered and this sort of thing and try and translate some of the humor that I put into Walking Eagle into this laughing drum show. Here's a look at Wednesday's weather forecast starting on the East Coast. Cloudy and 7 above in St. John's, plus 6 in Halifax. Snowy and minus 5 in Nain. A chilly minus 24 in La Grande. Sunny and minus 6 in Quebec. Minus 16 in Val d'Or. Minus 5 in Peterborough in Toronto, sunny and minus 11 in North Bay. Minus 11 in Sudbury, cloudy and minus 11 in Sioux Lookout. In northern Manitoba, minus 24 in Churchill, minus 17 in the Paw. Snowy and minus 12 in Barrens River, minus 8 in Winnipeg. Over to Saskatchewan, minus 3 in Estevan, Regina and Swift Current, minus 5 in Saskatoon. Minus 8 in Meadow Lake, minus 17 in Stony Rapids. The National Energy Board is in Burnaby, BC this week to hear from homeowners directly affected by the Trans Mountain Pipeline Expansion Project. As APTN's Tina House explains, despite provincial and federal approval, there is strong opposition from the cities of Burnaby and Vancouver. 
A small group of concerned citizens who call themselves the Burnley residents who oppose Kinder Morgan expansion, otherwise known as Broke, gathered outside of a Burnaby hotel as the National Energy Board began three days of hearings. 93-year-old Elsie Dean has lived in Burnaby for 40 yes. years. She says it was important for her to be here. I consider it almost an insane thing to think that you should could put all that oil into a, a populated city. The National Energy Board is expected to hear from homeowners and Burnaby City Council. John Clark did not get invited to speak at the hearings, even though he lives 300 meters from the tank farm in Burnaby. The National Energy Board is basically a, a quasi-judicial body uh, with a lot of power, unelected, but able to make uh, uh, determine things on constitutional issues and they've been allowed to run roughshod and were given that uh, power by the, the Harper government. The city of Burnaby, which is where the projects, tank farms and terminal are currently located, has adamantly opposed the expansion project from the get-go. They have also just released this video showing the proposed route. It will cross salmon-bearing streams, neighborhoods, conservation areas and playgrounds. This National Energy Board is a fossil fuel board. It doesn't look at, you know, at our other sources of energy. It's ridiculous. And if you um, know about how small Burrard Inlet is and all the bridges and all the industrial traffic that's going on there, there is another insanity. The city of Vancouver has also expressed its disapproval of the project because of the environmental risks. The National Energy Board returns in March for further hearings. Kinder Morgan did not return our request for an interview. Hey, Tina hey, House, APTN go. National Kinder News, Burnaby. There was a massive earthquake in the Gulf of Alaska overnight. The quake triggered tsunami warnings throughout coastal British Columbia and Alaska. The warnings have since been dropped but it was a horrifying start to the day for many. Sirens pierced the night air warning people in Port Alberni, BC of the looming threat. Similar scenes were repeated throughout coastal British Columbia and Alaska as residents were told to move to higher ground. Then it was several tense hours as people waited for word. There's no final agreement yet for the 60 Scoop class action lawsuit settlement, but the agreement in principle has been released. And while there might be more money for plaintiffs, there could be many Scoop survivors who don't get a penny. APTN Investigates reporter John Murray has more. The firm contracted to manage the applications and settlement for the 60 Scoop lawsuit has released the agreement in principle for the settlement. There are anywhere from 20,000 to 200,000 survivors that may be eligible for this settlement. They can now participate in developing the details of the final agreement, which the government has capped at a maximum of $750 million. Survivors who don't like the agreement in principle will have the opportunity to go to court at their own expense to present their objections. But this agreement in principle still does not include compensation for Métis and non-status adoptees. And that doesn't sit well with the Assembly of First Nations. Last year, they passed a resolution that rejects any settlement that does not include all Aboriginal peoples. The AFN says they will fight this current agreement. APTN National News reached Lee McMillan by telephone. He is a lawyer with DD West LLP, the firm supported by the AFN resolution. Well, our thoughts are uh, overwhelmingly negative. Um, we do not believe that the uh, what is being proposed in this proposed settlement agreement is fair, reasonable, or in the best interests of the 60 scoop survivors across Canada. So we will be using um, every tool in our arsenal to ensure that the agreement in its current form is, is not finalized. Some say $750 million is too little. If there are as many as 100,000 survivors applying, that will only be 7,500 each and nothing for Métis and non-status Indians. Learn more about the 60 Scoop and the children taken away this Friday on APTN Investigates. John Murray, APTN Investigates, Winnipeg. Time for another quick break. Let's stick around. There's more to come.
Here's the rest of Wednesday's weather forecast picking back up in northern Alberta. Minus 14 in high level, minus 11 in Grand Prairie. Cloudy and minus 5 in Edmonton and Red Deer. A balmy plus 10 in Medicine Hat. Heading to the west coast, plus 9 in Victoria, plus 2 in Bella Coola. Minus 1 in Prince George, minus 10 in Fort St. John. In Yukon, a cold minus 22 in Rock River, minus 23 in Old Crow. Over to NWT, minus 19 in Trout Lake and Ray Lakes, minus 21 in Fort Simpson. Cloudy and minus 19 in Fort McPherson, minus 23 in Saks Harbor. Sunny skies in parts of Nunavut, minus 27 in Arviat, minus 29 in Chesterfield. Minus 29 in Resolute, minus 28 in Clyde River. Welcome back. Human kindness was in action in Winnipeg last weekend when Olympic athlete and humanitarian Clara Hughes took a tour with a local group dedicated to helping young men get out of gangs. CTV Winnipeg's Beth McDonnell has more. I want to thank you guys from the bottom of my heart. I love you. Sundays with Ogijita Pimatwin Kinematwin, OPK for short, start with ceremony. Around a fire, sharing stories, and thanks. All of you are my heroes. You really are. Special guest Clara Hughes is here to take part in a tour with the Winnipeg group, which supports Indigenous youth. Stephen Michael Gagnon joined at 16. Growing up, he struggled, got into gangs while coping with fetal alcohol syndrome and ADHD. It makes me feel loved, like I have a family, like I grew up with no family and stuff and being with OPK and stuff, it's like, it's like a family. In the North End, OPK delivers furniture and food donations and cooks for the hungry. Witnessing the generosity, Hugh sees young people's potential unfolding. When you're dealing with, with different situations in life, sometimes you can become very isolated and opportunities are not there and these are opportunities that give them real life experiences and let them shine and let their leadership come out. She is fired. <laughs> On this Sunday, the cooked food is for a celebration, the five-year anniversary of Got Bannock. Althea Gabosh, once homeless, hands out fresh food to some of the city's most vulnerable. Having Hughes here on this day means the world to OPK. Like I knew her a little bit, but she can work with us anytime. Her spirit is beautiful. Uh, we did a couple of home visits today and she connected with the people and she's so kind and loving and, and she really supports us. I still manage to, to live my life as, as the best I can. Gagnon is now 23. He says he has good and bad days but being with OPK is the best support he could ask for. People caring about one another, coming back together again next Sunday. Beth Macton, LCTV News, Winnipeg. Everybody greet our brother. Great story. That's your APTN National News for this Thursday. Stick around for a repeat episode of Face to Face with Dennis Ward. And for news anytime, visit our website, aptnnews.ca. I'm Brittany Hobson. Have a great night.